this time of year, right between winter and spring. We're coming out of the dirty, we're coming out of the mud, we're coming out of the cold, and things are starting to turn colors, right? You can kind of see fruit trying to show up. You can kind of see that tree trying to blossom. You can see your grass trying to turn green and trying to grow. I love this time of year. It's a time of year where I can roll my window down. I still got heat on the feet, right? But the window's down, and I'm feeling good, and I'm excited for what's coming, and I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating all of that. I think that that, that is why Easter is at the time that it is. Because it's a great time. We're coming out of winter. We're all a little tired of it, both physically, emotionally, and maybe spiritually. Maybe you are coming through a dry season, a cold season, even a dead season. And Easter is a time of year where you can just avail yourself to the voice of God. You can avail yourself to the purposes of God. And we come into a room on Easter, and this room was electric last week, wasn't it? Just the anticipation of what's God going to do. The anticipation of God speaking. It's, it's just like what's happening outside. And God moved, and God worked, and God spoke, and God redeemed in many ways. And so here's the question. Now what? Now what do we do? we got to get back to regular life. It's still springtime outside, but spiritually and in this house, what do we do on the back end of Easter Sunday? And so we titled this two-week series, Spring. Because there is some fruit that I hope continues to grow. There is some fruit that I hope remains. There is some fruit that I hope God makes a mainstay in your life. Our church really is built on this question. There's two sides to God's working. One is, how do I prepare for God to work? How do I position myself to join what God is doing? And so let me just say it to you this way. You don't need to ask God to work. God wants to work. God is at work. Your job is to prepare yourself and to align yourself for where God is working. You don't have to say, please, please, pretty, please, God, would you do it? God's waiting to be at work. And so how do we as a church and how do you as an individual position yourself to hear from God? And then once God speaks, what type of discipleship do I need to do? What type of response do I need to do? Now, here's something that is very important for us that I want to be abundantly clear with you about. I need us to move away from this idea and this language of calling discipleship curriculum and curriculum discipleship. That's not how the Bible talks about it. We are in a time in our country coming out of the industrial age and into the technological age where we tend to think of our faith like a factory. I put this in and this comes out. How many of you know in your spiritual life that you have put something in and nothing has come back out? And as Americans in particular, we say, wait, wait, I put it in, where is it? I did it, where is it? God, you owe me. God, I did it. God, I completed it. God, I know it. But that's not the way that God talks about discipleship. God talks about discipleship not like an industrial process, but like an agricultural process. And God could have, God could have chosen prophetically to say, the way that I work is like a big old factory. The way that I work is like a biomedical engineering process. God, it's not like God wasn't up to date on the tech. God wanted you to know how he intended to work. God gets to choose how he works. Amen? You don't get to dictate to God how he works. You respond to God how he works. And how God says that he will work is in seasons and in rhythms and in agricultural processes. So we have to get away from this idea of discipleship, that discipleship is something that I go through. Something that I start and something that I finish. Something that I learn and then I'm good. Something that I achieve and then it's over. The Bible never talks about discipleship that way. Now, there are things that we do to try to educate you. There are processes that we put you through. Pastor Jeff and I are doing a rewrite of directions because we understand that theological and doctrinal training is important. But if you go through directions, it doesn't make you done with discipleship just like next winter spring is going to happen. You don't get done with it. You don't say, yep, done with that. Now I'm good. What's next? Please give me more. That's not the way the Bible talks about it. And so our church, we want to be a church that all of the things that we do have discipleship at their core. All of the things that we pursue have discipleship at their core. Here's the way that the Bible addresses it. In the parable of the sowers, Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8, all of the synoptic gospels talk to us this story that Jesus told about the soil of the heart. 
God looks at the soil of the heart. God calls you to prepare the soil of your heart to be ready for what he wants to do and say. There's some hearts that are thorny. There's some hearts that are hard. There's some hearts that are soft. That's why I say discipleship is preparing God to work. That's our job. And then responding to God once he has worked. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Paul is speaking. Listen to what he says. He says, I planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wagers according to his labor. Here it is, for we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's field, God's building. I am God's field. I am God's building. God wants to plant some things in me. God wants to grow some things in me. It is my responsibility to avail myself to the seeds of discipleship, to water them, to nurture them, to weed them, and it is God's job to produce fruit. And so a Christian isn't somebody who, like a factory, goes through a process and says, Woo! That was really good. I liked it. Thank God I'm done. No, a Christian is somebody who is regularly evaluating their heart. Is my heart hard to this? Is my heart thorny to this? Is my heart rejecting this? Am I availing myself to seeds being planted? Am I watering those seeds? Am I pulling the weeds of my, the seeds that God is planting? Anyone's yard looks like, look like a dandelion field right now? Yeah, some of our hearts look that way too. That God's put good seed in and we've watered it, and now all these weeds are coming up. That's not a start-stop. That's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process. And so what I want to do today is I just want to pastor you as best as I know how in the simplest way that I know how. Because when the Bible talks about discipleship, there's nothing complicated about it. I need you to come off of this idea that it's got to be deep and complicated for God to like it. That's not how God works. A seed is a very simple thing, isn't it? If you try to complicate a seed, you're going to mess the seed up. The job of a seed is to go into soil and to grow over time. You don't get to dictate how long. You don't get to dictate what comes up. Your job is to prepare the soil of your heart and to put a simple seed that might bring forth fruit that glorifies God and we can celebrate together. Now, let me help us understand this a little bit. My mom had a favorite saying when we were growing up, and that saying was, I want you to bloom where you planted. Anyone else's mama say that? That sounds like it's on a coffee cup. Do you know why? Because it's on every coffee cup that's ever been created, right? (laughs) It's just one of those sayings. But here's the idea behind that. The idea is I'm just going to accept where I am. I'm going to accept that it happened. I'm going to accept this part in my journey. Please listen to me. I'm going to, what John Maxwell says, I'm going to observe the law of intentionality. I'm going to just say, my past hasn't been what I hoped that it would be. My story hasn't been what I hoped that it would be. I wish that I had their story or her story or those stories, but I have this story. And by the sovereignty of God, I'm going to accept gladly what has happened. I'm going to propose gladly what I hope will happen, but I'm going to bloom where I'm planted based on what's happened by the sovereignty and grace of God. Don't hope for somebody else's journey. Don't hope for somebody else's story. Don't say, if only it was like that, it would be easier. If only I were like them, it would be better. No, you're you by the sovereignty of God. And God has things that he wants to plant in your heart, plant in your mind, plant in your story that he wants to grow up, not in my heart, in your heart. And your job is to prepare your heart based on the reality of where you're planted to allow God to grow whatever he wants for his glory and your joy. Are you with me today? You got to bloom where you're planted. You got to be intentional about letting certain seeds get into your life. Here's what I know about farming. It's very little, (laughs) but I do know this. I do know that the only way that it's going to grow is if somebody chooses to put that simple seed into that tender soil and then to nurture it through the entire process. Yes? Yes. Is that how it works, farming friends? Yes. Yes, that's how it works. You take a simple truth, you apply it to your heart, and you trust God to grow it up so that you can bloom where you're planted. And so I'm going to give you two seeds that I want you to plant today. 
two seeds that I want you to plant today, and they are very simple. They're not complicated. You can walk out and you can do it before you even get to your car. Very simple truths, very simple realities that represent discipleship that allow you to prepare your heart for what God wants to do in and through your life coming off of Resurrection Sunday. Here's the first seed. Planting seeds of knowing God. Planting seeds of knowing God. Here's the thing that you got to ask yourself. Do you really want to know God? I'm, I'm being for real. Do you really want to know God above all other people that you could know? Do you really want a relationship with God? Do you really want God to speak and you to be able to speak back? Do you really want to see God work? Do you really want to give God everything in your life? Do you really want God to be the king of your life, for him to be the leader of your life, for you to have a relationship with him that you know him and that he knows you? Do you really trust God at that level? Do you want to enjoy God? Do you really want to enjoy God? Because God says that he's enjoyable. Not that many Christians I know know and enjoy God. Do you really, are you really willing to do what it takes to put your heel in the ground, to take that simple seed, to put it into the soil of your life, and to trust God for it to grow? Here's what I can promise you. God knows you, and God enjoys you. Is the, is the opposite true? Do you want to know God? Do you want to enjoy God? If so, here's simple seeds. The first seed is this. You got to get baptized. You say, you got to get baptized? That's not like me going and get, going to seminary, right? That's not like me going through a study. I told you it wasn't going to be complicated. I told you that a seed is a simple thing that just goes into the soil of a willing and tender and open heart. If you're in here today and you haven't been baptized, please understand that God calls you to make a personal decision that's publicly declared. It's a personal decision that's publicly declared. And what are you declaring? I want to know God and I want him to lead me and I want you to know. I need your help. I believe that God puts a community around me to nurture the seed that he puts into my life. Some of us in here have never made that decision. And let me tell you why you don't have certain fruit in your life, because you haven't ever planted seeds of obedience through baptism. You haven't ever publicly declared your intent to follow, to know, to enjoy, to obey God. There is certain fruit that is only tied to certain seed. This isn't about laws and rules and you just got to do it. We don't know why. No, this is about you and your heart being tender to what God tells you to do. This is about your acknowledgement that you need God to be at work, your acknowledgement that you need a church around you, your acknowledgement that I need to say accountably and publicly I intend to obey God so that when I don't, all the people who saw my baptism will say, didn't you get baptized? I did. Okay, take care of the soil of your heart. Some of you have been Christians for years, and you've never planted that very simple seed in your heart, and it's why you don't have certain fruit. Because you never took the simplicity of obedience and a public faith and put it into your heart and said, God, I trust you for whatever fruit comes of this, but I'm going to do my part to plant and water seeds of obedience and baptism. You say, well, you're guilt tripping me and condemning me. What should I do? You should walk outside those doors and sign up to get baptized next week. That's what you should do. It's very simple, isn't it? And somewhere along the way, churches have made simple things complicated. Right? What happens when I get baptized? Should I get sprinkled? Should I get dunked? I, hey, I don't care. I don't care because it's not about the medium. It's about the soil of your heart and the seed of obedience. It's about you saying, publicly, I want you to know, I want to know and enjoy God. But I'm afraid of water. Get over it. <laughs> but I'm afraid of my hair getting jacked up. I don't understand, first of all. But get over it. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Listen, we're not going to hold you down. We're not going to try to drown you. We're just going to give you a microphone to say, this is who I am by the grace of God, and I'm planting this seed in my heart for all of you to see. Will you help me nurture water, the soil of my heart, so this obedience to, can grow into God-glorifying fruit? If you've never been baptized, get baptized. Do it next week on our birthday. Come on, somebody. Right? <laughs> Get baptized. Plant that seed 
in your heart. Let God take that simple obedience and grow it into something greater for our blessing and for his glory. Will you do that? Will you do that? I hope that you will. I hope that you won't overcomplicate this. I won't hope that you won't make this something that it isn't. This is just a very simple declaration. It's the first seed toward you knowing and enjoying God. The second seed is this. I told you it was simple. Are you ready for it? Read your Bible. Read my Bible? What are you talking about? I need a study on end times. No, you don't. No, you don't. I need to know what all the types and all the numbers mean. No, you don't. Well, I want to. Well, that's different than needing to. It's amazing to me, absolutely amazing to me, how Christians will argue about things, will make big deals about things, will criticize things, will criticize model and means and mediums, and they don't read their Bible every day. Listen. If you're in here today, I love you. I'm glad that you're here. If you aren't spending time with God on a daily basis, your opinion means very little to me. What? I think that you should preach on, great, did you read your Bible yesterday? Well, no. God bless you. I'm for real. We, we make this too complicated. We make this too difficult. Every single day, you need to read your Bible. Every day, even Tuesdays, even Tuesdays. Even Saturdays on the weekend, even Saturdays on the weekend. Why wouldn't you want that seed in your heart on a daily basis? I'm very busy. I know that's why you need to read your Bible every day. I got a lot going on. I know that's why you need good seed. It's amazing to me the seeds that we will allow the world to put into our heart and you won't spend time God, with God on a daily basis. And so every single day, every single day, read the Bible every day. Plant the seed in your heart every day. Can I tell you this? I would encourage you to do it before you check your email. Be you know why? Because you start reading your email and those seeds of busyness, those seeds of anxiety, those seeds of stress, those seeds of pressure get planted in your heart and you willingly allow it every single day. So put your heel in the ground. And say, coming off Easter, I felt like God spoke to me, and my response is that I want him to continue to speak to me every single day. Now, there's a difference between reading to finish or reading for information. I'm talking about reading to know God. I'm talking about reading to enjoy God. Here's what you will find out. As you read to know God, you will find out that he already knows you. You will find out that he already loves you, that he already enjoys you, that he's got good plans for you. It is on every single page in this book. Every single page in this book represents God's heart, God's blessing, God's glory for you. Read it every single day. Matthew 7 and verse 24, Jesus is talking. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine, everyone who hears the word of God and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Everybody who hears these words of mine, listen, it is not enough for you to hear me talk about the Bible once a week. It's not enough seed. Why? Because you got a lot of weeds that are getting planted Monday through Saturday. Don't come in here expecting me to do all of the work of planting good seed in your heart only on Sunday. Secondly, I'm not God. You don't need to know and enjoy me. You need to know, enjoy him. Don't plant your life on the rock of Tim. It's very, very weak and minuscule. Trust me. Plant your life on the rock of God's word every single day. Every single day. You say, I'm stressed. That's because your feet are wobbly. You say, I'm anxious. That's because your feet are on sand. You say, I'm under a lot of pressure. That's because your feet are in the wrong place. Every day you need to spend time with God. Every day you need to hear from God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, is profitable for reproof, and is profitable for correction, is profitable for training in righteousness, that the man and woman, come on somebody, of God might be complete and equipped for every good work. God, I want you to use me. Read your Bible! Come on, somebody. 
I am tired of Christians arguing about goofy stuff. I'm tired of Christians making it more complicated than it needs to be. I'm tired of churches splitting and criticisms and condescensions. Read your Bible every day. Plant that seed in your life every day. You say, how do I do that? I'm going to help you. Pick a plan. Pick a plan. You say, what do you mean? There's a million apps. I'll tell you the one that I use, the YouVersion Bible app. There are 10 million plans on the YouVersion Bible app. Which one should I read? I don't care. Whichever one you want, whichever one looks interesting. I will tell you that I read through the one-year Bible. I do it with 27 other people on the YouVersion app. I can see if Pastor John hasn't read his Bible on Tuesdays. And I go into his office, and I say, come on, man, we're trying to do good work, and you ain't even reading your Bible. And he does the same for me. Come on, let's plant good seeds. Pick a plan. Pick a time. Pick a time. Why? Because you're busy. And because your life begins, I will tell you that your, my life begins as soon as I pick up that stupid phone, doesn't it? It just starts happening to me. It starts talking to me, binging to me, bonging to me, vibrating to me, doing all these kind of things, telling me what to do. And so I will tell you that what I find to be the most helpful is that I have a plan and that I have a time, and it is before I start my day. Most days, I am reading my Bible before my feet are on the floor. My wife will tell you that. Most days. If I get out of bed, I go to a little spot in our house beside a fireplace, I get a cup of coffee or whatever I'm drinking that morning, and I read my Bible every morning because I need it every single morning. Every single morning. Pick a plan, pick a time, and pick a place. I just told you my two places. I read it in my bed or I read it by the fireplace. If you see me reading my Bible plan someplace else, something has gone wrong throughout the day. Every day, read your Bible. Every day, plant that seed. Every day you wake up, you say, I don't want to read my Bible. That's an issue of the soil of your heart. Plant seed, even in tough soil, every single day. And here's what will happen. As you read it, it will read you. As you spend time with God looking at him, you will see that he's looking at you, and he will be training you and correcting you and challenging you and encouraging you. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've come to God with a lot of things on my heart and been reading through Lamentations. Come on, somebody. Lamentations or Malachi or Zechariah, and God's been like, this is for you today. Now, does that happen every day? No, but I'm not going to miss the day that it could have happened. Plant seeds, read your Bible, get baptized. You see how simple this is? Be careful to not make this too complicated. Be careful to not make this an intellectual pursuit. This is not an intellectual pursuit. If it were, God would have said, it's kind of like going to college. He didn't. He said, it's kind of like running a farm. That's what discipleship is. Number three, it's simple. I promise you, I told you it would be simple. You want to know what it is? Get baptized, read your Bible, and pray. That's it. Every day. Every single day. Let me help you with this. How would your relationships be, your human relationships be, if you talk to them in the way that you talk to God? Listen, if my relationship with my wife was commiserate to how often I talk to God and the way I talk to God, in other words, like this, Hey, babe, good morning. Uh, here's the list of things that I need from you today. Okay, see you later. Isn't that how we pray? Hey, here's all the things I'm stressed out about. Here's all the things I'm bummed out about. Okay, see you later. See you, see you in three days. Or if something goes wrong before then. Right? Am I lying? I'm not lying. Yeah. If our, re if our human relationships were the same in terms of how often and the tone in which I pray to God, most of our relationships would be wrecked. They'd be completely wrecked. And so this is something that we need to do on a daily basis. Now, let me just be honest with you. Praying is hard, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Don't lie, you'll go straight to hell. All right? <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. Okay. 
Chuck Swindoll, uh, in one of his books, says it this way, to be painfully honest with you, most of the stuff that I have ever read or heard about prayer has either left me under a ton and a half truckload of guilt or wearied me with pious-sounding cliches and meaningless God talk. I love this. Because I didn't spend two or three grueling hours a day on my knees as dear Dr. So-and-so did, or because I wasn't able to weave dozens of scripture verses through my prayer, or because I'd never been successful in moving mountains, I picked up the distinct impression that I was out to lunch when it came to this part of the Christian life. Have you been there? I've been there, man. I've been there. Listen, there are things that happen that I just talk to God in ways that I probably shouldn't or in tones that probably aren't worthy of him. But here's what God tells me to do. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Now, if you misunderstand the intent of this, if you make this a legalistic medium by which God requires you to talk to him, that verse will make you stressed out you'll end up in the exact same place that Dr. Swindoll ended up, that prayer will become a weight or a duty that is weak and lifeless. And so here's how I want to help you. Don't make prayer an obligation or an event. Don't make prayer an obligation or an event. Make prayer just something that you do throughout the day. Okay, so when I read through my Bible in the morning, I will typically pray over my day at the end of that, but then throughout the day, I'm going through my day, and it's as simple as this. God, I'm going into a meeting. Please bless it for your glory, and I walk into the meeting. God, that person is ticking me off. I want to punch them in the throat. God, please forgive me for that, right? God, I'm getting stressed out. God, I got a lot going on. God, I'm tired. God, I'm happy. God, this is awesome. God, thank you for this meal. God, thank you for this experience. God, thank you for this church. I'm not like, dear heavenly father, we gather today in thy name to praise this thou glory, right? No. Don't make prayer an event. Pray without ceasing, just praying throughout the day. Here's the way that Jesus says it. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Don't make that call. What does that mean? What does the Greek mean? It means keep God close. That's what it means. Keep God near the top of your mind. God, I'm heading home. God, help me to be a good husband. Help me to be a good daddy tonight. God, I'm, I'm paying bills. I hate paying bills, right? God, thank you for providing for me. God, I pray that you continue to do so. God, I'm going to strangle my kid. Thank you for my kid. God, I pray that you bless him and that you welcome him into heaven as he's about to arrive there, right? right? No, like... Listen, it, this isn't, it's just an ongoing day. Christians should be walking around muttering with a smile on their face. That dude talks to himself. I ain't talking to myself, I'm talking to Jesus. <laughs> if you are waiting for prayer to get easy, it is not going to get easy. That's why it just needs to be, so, I'm just keeping God close throughout my day. God, keep me safe as I drive home. God, thank you for this meal. God, thank you for that conversation. God, today's a hard day. God, my wife and I have been arguing for three days in a row. I don't want to go home, right? That's, that's you. That's not me. I always want to go home, right? <laughs> no, it's just, it's just quick statements throughout the day. It's not like God needs to be addressed in order for him to start paying attention. It's not like God needs you to pray in old English for him to acknowledge you. I, I'm... I'm Short, quick, keeping God close, abiding in him. He said, I don't, know, I don't know how to pray. I want you to go out to the next steps desk, and I want you to sign up for us to send you a prayer journal that gives you many, many different avenues and mediums to pray through. It's something that changed my personal life whenever I started committing to try to be a praying man. How do, I don't even know how to pray, so pray through the Lord's Prayer. Pray through the tabernacle prayer. Pray through spiritual warfare. We'll email you that for absolute free. Just give us your email, and we'll send it out to you tomorrow. But I want to help you in the simplicity of hearing from God and in talking to God every single day in response to a God who is at work, in response to a God who knows you, who sees you, who enjoys you, who loves you, who wants to bring good fruit into your life that remains for his glory and your joy. Don't make it complicated. 
Don't make it about a factory. Don't make it about the tech age. Be a good farmer. Tend the soil of your life. Plant good seeds in it and trust God to give you fruit that he wants. Second seed, going to be quick, is seeds of friendship. Seeds of friendship. Here's the question. Do you want more friends? You say, I got enough friends. Fine. Do you want better friendships? Do Do you want deeper friendships? Here's what I need you to understand. In order for you to experience positive change, you will need positive relationships. Listen, you start knowing God, you start enjoying God, and God is always going to push you into community. That's why the two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Got it. I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray. And love your neighbor as yourself. These two are the same thing. This is really just one seed. Because if you start to know and enjoy God, you're going to start acknowledging that you need friendships that help you know and enjoy God. And so here's how this works. The first thing is to find friends. This is very deep and very profound. Buckle your chin strap. Are you ready for it? To find friends, you need to be friendly. (laughs) Wow. What does that mean in the Greek? Stop it. That's what it means. Knock it off. Okay? Yeah. Proverbs 18, 24. A man who has friends must show himself friendly. Now, now let me help you with this because we have terrible language around this. We have terrible self-talk because we think that when we're friendly, we're putting ourselves out there and we're risking rejection. No, you're just planting a seed that God might bloom into a friendship. That's all that's happening. And so I want to be somebody who's committed to friendliness. I'm committed to just being a good neighbor. I'm committed to being somebody that people enjoy being around with no strings attached. It's not that if I'm nice to Pastor John, then we have to be best friends for the rest of our life. It's not how it works. This isn't a factory, right? And this is what we do in the church. We say, I was friendly to you, now you be friendly back to me. (laughs) They weren't friendly to me. I knew it. Uh, No, stop. Stop. People at this church don't want to stop. Just plant more seeds of friendliness. Just just put put yourself in a position that when you interact with people, they walk away and say, that person's nice, that's it. You don't know what God might want to bloom that plant, that seed into. You might be standing across from your next very best friend. You're just rude. You're just distracted. You're just busy. You're just looking down at your stupid phone. It's amazing how we are living in a day that we're lonelier than ever. I just want friends. Oh. What? Uh, Pastor John and I were out of town this week, and we were walking through the airport, and I literally almost ran over 19 people on the way to our gate who were on their phone. Just walking. Oh, turn around, turn into me. If you want to have friends, you have to be friendly. You have to be paying attention. You have to not be distracted. And it has to be no strings attached. I'm going to be nice to you whether you're nice to me or not. I'm going to be friendly to you. Isn't this complicated? I'm just going, I'm just going to plant seeds of friendliness into you that might bloom into friendship that might mean that we're able to have a sharpening relationship. But if God doesn't bloom it into that, it's fine. I'm still going to be friendly to you. Don't be rude. Don't be distracted. Don't ignore people. Don't think you're better than all of us, okay? Just be friendly. That's it. It's discipleship. I don't want to be friendly. That's an issue of the soil of your heart. I got a lot to do. That's an issue of the soil of your heart and the boundaries that you allow or don't allow on it. I don't like them. That's that's your issue. That's not their issue. Well, discipleship is just a lesson that I get. No, discipleship is every interaction that you have between this room and the door. Number two, friendship is your path to freedom. Friendship is your path to freedom. Our second value, our first value here is that we want people to know and enjoy God. Our second value is that we want people to find friends. You say, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual unless you read James 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. This is a mind-blowing verse to me. 1 John 1, 19 says, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Amen? Amen. 
If you want forgiveness, confess your sins to God. But if you want healing, confess them to a friend. Is that what it says? That's what it says. Confess them to a friend. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and it's working. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to be friendly to all y'all. I'm going to plant seeds of kindness and of friendliness into everybody that I interact with. And if God sees to bloom that plant of friendship between you and I, I will be grateful to him and to you for the friendship that it provides both of us. Once we get to a place in our friendship where we are seeking to know and enjoy God together, there will be times when I do dumb stuff. There will be times that I am doing things that you don't know. There will be times that I'm stuck in areas that are a secret to somebody else. There will be times that I am under the weight of demonic and spiritual oppression and I need somebody to pray for me. Who should I ask to pray for me at that point? That person that you were friendly to who became your friend and I'm going to be vulnerable to you because you have shown me that I can trust you to pray for me and point me to Jesus. I'm preaching 98% better than you all are responding right now. Listen to me, your strength, your strength is directly tied to your secrets. I'm trying to help you. Your spiritual vitality is directly tied to the amount of secrets that you keep, meaning the more secrets that you have, the weaker you'll be. Listen, I know you can't stop looking at it. I already know that. But the enemy wants you to keep it a secret so that he can shame you and debilitate you spiritually. I know you've been arguing with him. I know you're in debt up to your eyeballs. I know that you have an anger problem. I know you're addicted to it. I know your mental health. I already know. You're not the only person you think that you're helping by not admitting it is yourself, but the opposite is occurring. You are killing yourself by keeping that secret. And so I'm asking you very simply, just even while you're just in the building, get off your phone. Keep your head up. Be friendly. Smile. Look as beautiful as you are and as reasonably handsome as the rest of you are, all right? <laughs> just be friendly with no strings attached. God knows what you need. God knows you need friends. God knows you need community. He exists in friendship and community. It's called the Trinity. He knows he created you for it. And so here's what you do. You say, God, I want to plant seeds of friendliness today, and I'm going to trust you to bring me a friend when you see fit. And once you bring me a friend, I'm not going to keep secrets from that friend. I'm going to be honest with that friend so that friend can pray for me and point me to you because you know and I know that I need it. Don't complicate it. Don't complicate it. Spring is a great time to air some things out. It's a great time to air some things out. You do it in your house do it in your soul. Do it in your relationships. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to, one, get away from factory and industrial processes when it comes to discipleship. That's not how God talks about it. That's not how you've experienced. It's not how it works. I'm asking you to commit to taking very simple seeds. I just gave you five. Get baptized. Read your Bible. Pray. Be friendly. Confess your sins. Those five things. I'm asking you to plant them in the soil of your heart and to pray that God will bloom them as he sees fit for his glory and your enjoyment. Can you do that? Do you receive this today? All right, awesome. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us today. We are super stoked to announce our new album, One Savior, is available today. So you can go to gracewayworship.com to download your free copy or you can stream it on Apple Music or Spotify. We hope you enjoy it. 